back a number of years ago in a little town in Ohio called Bel Air, Ohio. Um, I'm sure nobody has ever heard of it because it's barely on the map nowadays. But it's uh, on the Ohio River, just, just barely south of Interstate 70. And this man had a reputation in the area as a womanizer, a gambler, an alcoholic, and he didn't also take very good care of his wife and children. And uh, that was his reputation in that town. He had uh, three children. Uh, he had a son, two daughters. And the son decided because there was no money ever for the family, the mother had to work to take care of his And take care of the children. When he went to high school, he got tired of wearing clothes that you know were all beat up and torn up. So he got himself a job at the local men's store. And he, what he did was he would earn money so he could put on some nice clothes and go to school, and then when he graduated from high school, he joined the United States Air Force, and they would get out of that town. And over the years. He uh, well, he was in the Air Force for a number of years, rose up to the rank of a staff sergeant or the first strategic air command, and ended up out of the Air Force base out in Topeka, Kansas. And that's where he settled. And uh, over the years, he did what he had to do to take care of his family, and he drove a truck, which he hated doing. But that's what he did. It wasn't just driving the truck. He delivered the groceries to, it was called IGA, Independent Grocery Association, if any of you ever heard of the stores. So what they would do is they would bring this, all these produce, all the groceries to a big warehouse. They would have to go load them up at four o'clock in the morning. And he'd drive them to the grocery store, unpack them by hand, we'd get them in the store, and then they'd put them in the store. It was horrible work. He didn't like it and did what he had to do to take care of his family. When he was in his 30s, he had a chance to start selling cars, you know. And he started to really make a change in his life financially and for his family. And he was known as Honest Jack. Because of his integrity and his honesty and what he did. And Jeff can tell you there's uh, there's not a good reputation in a lot of our business for integrity and honesty. But people knew that if it came to Jack, they would be taken care of. And they would be treated honestly and fairly. And so the first month he was in business, because of his reputation, he became the salesman of the month for that particular dealership, it was the Ford dealership in town, the biggest one in the whole area. Became the salesman of the month, and over that first year, he became salesman of the year for that dealership. So, it, because his reputation was so good. But he developed a different type of reputation than he had from his father. He became very good. And that man was my dad. But he had three children. He had me as the oldest, my brother, and my sister. Unfortunately, I did not carry on the same that reputation that he had decided to build in that town. My brother and I were known in our part of town as, as the large troublemakers. And uh, if the Lawrence brothers came, you knew there was going to be problems. So the kids in the neighborhood didn't like us because if we didn't like you, we just beat you up. That's when we were little. When we got a little bit older and we got into drugs and all that kind of stuff, our reputation was known as being pretty vicious. And so we would, uh, we were hanging out with some pretty rough people who we were teenagers in high school. And the crowd that we hung out with were 30 some year olds ex felons. 
And that's who we ran around with, and we would go steal for them. That's how we earned extra money. They would, we would steal stuff out of people's garages and houses to earn some extra money and give it to them. We were known for our drugs and everything else. So the reputation that I had, my dad used to say he would call the police department once a week to figure out which child he was supposed to come and pick up. But then I got born again. When I was 17. And I started to realize for the first time what it was like to build integrity in my life. Um, and our third elder meeting, Mike Tracy shared a little bit about reflecting on his past. That was interesting to me because he talked about how he was looking for something in his life. And he didn't find it where he should have been. And I was the same way. I didn't find what I was looking for. When I was about 12 years old, I'd gone to the Billy Graham crusade in our hometown. Uh, the younger folks won't realize this, but Billy Graham could come, they would send in representatives from his organization. They would play movies in the big theater, invite everybody in. And they had their representatives, they'd play this movie, which would get you real inspired. And then you'd go down to the front and they'd take you in the back of the theater and then they would give you these tracks and you know, tell you to go home, pray, get involved with the church, you know, read your Bible and all that. So for the next month, what I started doing was I would read my Bible every day, my little Bible chart. I remember getting down on my knees every night and praying because I thought that's what I needed to do. But I was trying to find something in my life. But what had happened, and the reason my brother and I ended up the way that we did, is that at the end of a month of asking questions to my minister, having my mother drive me around at the church and talk to other ministers about the questions I had. They brought the minister and his wife or his wife over to our house for dinner after a long time. And after dinner, the minister said, Mike, I noticed that you've been asking a lot of questions. You've come to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, youth group, traveling to other churches. I'm really impressed. He says, after all that, what do you think? And I said, well, I believe that you're all a bunch of hypocrites and I never will go to a church again. Because every time I asked a question, I was told to get it on faith. You got to buy it on faith. And I was, I'm a pretty logical guy. I like things practical. I like to understand things. And I was like that at 12, and I didn't get an answer. So that's when I turned to the other stuff. But shortly after that, that my brother and I got involved with drugs, and that was kind of the road down. But the 17 things started to change. And I realized the reputation I had was not the reputation that I wanted to keep. So I had to change something in my life. I had to change my behavior. I had to change my lifestyle so that I could do what I needed to do. Fortunately, I was able to do that. My brother was not. And my brother died a couple years ago from a drug overdose. He was never able to pull himself out. As much as he was offered and given the opportunity, he just never put it together in his life. I'm not knocking him because he had a lot of tough things in his life, but we all make a choice on what kind of lives that we want to live. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 15 and 16. We're probably going to hear these verses a lot this weekend since that's our theme. I'm going to be reading a couple different versions while we're while I'm going through this, but they'll be either usually in the King James and the Amplified. This is in the King James. It says, Wherefore I also have for I heard of your faith. There's one of our key words for our thing. After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I thought Sheila did a great job last night talking about that. But I want to take that from a slightly different perspective. Because I want to take a look at what that's what I saw when I read that. As we were thinking about this particular theme, and I was praying about it. 
There was one phrase that kept coming back to my mind over and over and over again, and I didn't know where it was going to go, but it was a phrase called lifestyle of a believer. And as I thought more and more about that, some of you may be aware that there was a book written on that about Christian ethics. I didn't go there, but it was the thought, what is the lifestyle of a believer all about? The Ephesian believers must have been phenomenal believers. Because it wasn't that Paul says he observed the sin of it, says he what? He heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love in all the saints. The Ephesians had a reputation of doing that. And he had talked about it. And because of that, because of what that reputation that they had, the lifestyle that they had developed so that this was part of their life, he says, I cease not to give thanks for you and make mention of you in my prayers. Sheila said that Ephesians was the breakfast of champions. Ephesians is, uh, we've heard it say it's the apex of all, all the revelation and in the church of history because it brings up to the pinnacle what God sees and wants for us. So these Ephesian believers, doesn't say they were perfect other than perfect in Christ, right? But as far as their actions, but they had developed a lifestyle to where their faith and love had been heard of. Must have been amazing. Well, where did Paul hear that from? Paul traveled with people, people came to Paul, and as they people had passed through Ephesus and heard things, maybe letters had been exchanged, he heard about what they were doing, and he was so excited about it. They had developed a lifestyle, and they had built a godly reputation among the believers and leaders. Isn't that what we want? That's what I realized that I want. And when I first got into the Word, and I started to see some of these men and women that I started to look up to, rather than some of the other people I used to look up to, I realized I wanted to be more like them, and I also realized I wanted to be more like my own dad. My dad had to overcome a lot. So how do we build a reputation like those in Ephesus? That's really what I want to talk about. So that our faith in the Lord Jesus and our love in all the saints will be known by all other believers. We have to develop and build it as a lifestyle. We must develop a lifestyle of a believer by building a reputation of being faithful, loving believers within the body of Christ. So what's this foundation of how we build this type of reputation, godly Christian reputation? Let's go to Romans 10.9. This one you might have to turn to. We don't know this one right now. Come see me because I'll fill you out on the way. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thy heart that God will raise him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. After we're saved and born again, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? We get that. That's how we get born again. That's what separates us from the world. We're now children of God. And we have that spirit. It not only makes us a child of God, but it comes fully loaded, right? With all the spiritual enablements or abilities that we ever need to be more than conquerors in every situation, situation of life. We have the ability to operate all nine of the manifestations, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, faith, miracles, and healing. Why did we get nine? Because we didn't need ten. Nine's all we needed. It came with everything that we needed in this life to be successful. Except, and you say, wait a second. It says God blesses us with every spiritual blessing. It says that in Ephesians. But there's something that he did not give us. He didn't give us the now. Why? Because God also gave us free will. If he had given us the renewed mind to where now we thought everything that we had to think and do everything we had to do, then he would have had not only given the spirit, that spirit would have had to change you completely and take control of your mind and your thinking and your actions. We have free will. 
And you may think, gosh, God could have done this a lot easier and just made us perfect all the way around. Why didn't he do that? Because he loves us enough to allow us a choice. I talked about the lifestyle that my brother and I chose. He also came to a fellowship shortly after I lived, but he didn't decide to come back for a time. We were on the same path. We were as close as brothers could possibly be growing up. We shared a room, we had bunk beds. I still remember all the time. We just did everything together. He was a year and a half younger than me. When I got the word, I went on a completely different path. Our paths just went two separate directions. And he just chose that one his. I had to change my path dramatically, for me anyway, as a 17-year-old kid, I changed my path dramatically. Once we're born again, we must decide how to live our lives. We, we have to make the decision. It's our free will. We have to understand first how do we receive anything from God. We have to know what's available to God, right? This is kind of foundational stuff. How to receive it, what to do with it after we uh, have it, and how to use it once we receive it. We have to align our needs and wants to be parallel with the word of the Lord God. And we have to trust that what God promises, he is able and willing to do. But God gave us something. He gave us his word. That certainly give us his word in written form, didn't he? Because the success of the adversary is in what? The secrecy of his moves. He doesn't want you to know how he's going to work. He doesn't want you to understand that. But God said, I want you to understand it, so I'm going to give you my word. Isn't that wonderful? It provides us along, I think alone provides us with the truth when it comes to what to believe, knowing where and when we're wrong, and finding how to get back on track. And be aligned with God. So we're going to take a look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, but I'm going to read it from the Amplified. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. This is from the Amplified. All scripture is God worthy, given by his divine inspiration, is profitable for instruction, for conviction of sin. For correction, for error and restoration to obedience, for training in righteousness, learning to live in conformity to God's will, both publicly and privately, behaving honorably with personal integrity and moral courage, so that the man of God may be complete and proficient, outfitted and thoroughly equipped for every good work. I like this phrase when I talk about the lifestyle of a believer that says, learning to live in conformity to God's will. I don't mean about conformity, I don't know if I like that word per se. We have to change our mode to what God wants. That takes transformation, right? We have to go from here to here. The nature of man is to be contrary to the things of God. And without going to the verses in Ephesians, we can read that in Ephesians chapter 2. As a matter of fact, now that I think about it, they may actually be in my notes, they may actually go there. <laughs> but it was contrary. We went to the nature of the world. We flew into the course that the prince of the power of the air cell. We may have thought, oh, I'm different. I can choose my own path. But it's like a, a twig tossed into the river. The twig that is like, I'm going to go where I want to go. Well, it might go on this side of the river, it might go on that side of the river, but guess where it's going? It's going downstream no matter what it does. But once we get born again and decide to change our will to the will of God and we'll do those things, we now have the ability to swim upstream, so to speak. We can change the course of our life. We can actually get out of the stream. We don't have to follow it at all. If we're looking at how we build a believer's lifestyle, like those in Ephesians, we have to come back to what is the doctrine, the reproof and correction of God's word. Somebody asked me one time, well, what makes your ministry so different than everybody else? Well, I'd say one thing is, is that we truly come back to that the revealed word, that the, the Bible is a revealed word of God, right? 
This is it. And we believe it. And it's not just that we read it and then say, okay, I think it means this, or we apply it this way, or I can interpret it this way. We say that there are principles and keys on how the Bible interprets itself so that we can get back as closely as possible to the intent that God originally had when we had that. And we put our lives on the line for it. You know what we talk about the integrity of the word. We've got to stand for the integrity of the word. If we want to stand up for the integrity of the word, you know what you gotta have first? You gotta have some personal integrity. If you're willing to give here and there, it won't make any difference. Because you're going to sooner or later give on the word, too. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect. That's not the point. The point is, where are you going to make the commitment? What are you going to do to get to that lifestyle so that, like our theme back here, faith, love, thanks, and prayer, that's our lifestyle. When people see us, they go, yeah, Jeff, I know that person. This is how I see him. That's how I see you. We know that's how God sees us, but is that how others see us, especially believers who know? Once we are born again, we must learn to do God's will, both publicly and privately, not just when we observe or observe. Our lifestyle must be 24 by 7 by 365. We build our character and integrity by doing the right thing, even when no one is watching. Jesus referred to those who did this. Uh, when they were by uh, those that were being watched to do it for that. He referred to them as hypocrites to those who wanted to be watched for what they were doing. If you want to go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 2, we'll just take a look at what he said. There's another version I, I like sometimes because I, I think it makes the point. In Matthew 6, 2, this is the J.D. Phillips version. It says verse 5, oops, I'm sorry, I said 2, verse 5, and then when you pray, don't be like the play actors or the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that people may see them at it. Believe me, they have all the reward they are going to get. But when you pray, go into your own room, shut your door, and pray to your father privately, your father who sees all private things will reward you. I may try to impress Bob or Charlie or somebody else by trying to do certain things because I want to get, I want to impress them, I want them to like me. But you know what? When I go off by myself and I look in the mirror, I know what I see. I know what's on the inside if I'm being honest. And if I trick myself or I don't, I can't trick God. He knows what's deep in the heart. So if we're going to have integrity, it has to be all the time. I remember when I was in this uh, training program that we were in for two years, we had high school duties there. And one of the duties that we had was, uh, we called it scholarly, it was the dish room. Nobody liked going in the dish room because we had to do all the dishes for about 450 people three times a day. And we were all busy, we had lots of things and other responsibilities. So, Usually you got a little break after each meal, and but if you were on scullery, you didn't have to go and get all the dishes clean. And when you were done, you had to make sure that the room was clean too. You couldn't just leave. So usually they have maybe I don't know maybe ten or twelve people in there, and we'd all go in there. And it was interesting. I started watching, and we'd start out everybody be in there doing the work, and we get about halfway through, and I'd look around and. It was about eight people. And by the time we were done, we usually at the end of the day we have to take the rubber mats off the floors and put those through the dishwasher, mop the floors, do all that kind of stuff. And by the time we were done, a lot of times I looked around, there might be two or three people. Now, what surprised me is that some of the people that were leaving the earliest were the ones who were the leaders in, in the wakeboard in the training program. They were the ones standing up at, at, during the meetings and saying, you guys need to do this. We're going to hold you accountable for that. This is what you're supposed to be doing. And I'm thinking, okay, that's fine when you're standing up in front of all the other leaders and everybody can see you and you sound so great. But what happens when nobody can see you? Nobody ever came to the district and watched you to see if you stayed there. 
If you're going to be a real servant, wouldn't you be the one who'd be the last one to leave? To me, I saw the hypocrisy and the integrity there. And I'm not knocking those people. It's just like, okay, now, what else they're going to shortchange down the road? And unfortunately, some of those folks over the years, that's exactly what happened. We're not supposed to be hypocrites or pay play actors. We do what we need to do. We're not trying to impress anybody. We're trying to live the lifestyle of a believer. Things don't automatically change when we get born again. I said that. So what do we have to do? We have to do it through the renewed mind. Our mind controls all our actions and thoughts. Therefore, if we want to transform from our old man lifestyle to one that is godly and Christian, we must do it by changing what we might spend. And we find that in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read this again from the Amplified. I must have really liked the Amplified. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies, dedicating all of yourselves, set it apart as a living sacrifice, holy and well pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, and intelligent act of worship. You present your bodies. It's a figure of speech, meaning everything you have. So it's just not me and, okay, I'll do my part here, and then I'll, you know, and then I'll slide off over here and do my little, little personal thing over here. No, no. We present our whole body, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Everything that we have. Isn't that the first and great commandment to love God with what? All your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's 24 hours a day. How do we get there? We do that by renewing our mind. We start to transform ourselves from the world. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. We're told here that there are two conflicting ways to live. You're either going to be conforming to this world or you're going to be transforming yourself to be a wonderful, loving Christian believer. And we do that publicly and privately. We once followed the ways of the world, which are orchestrated by the prince of the power of the air. Oh, I skipped over some. I did say I want to go to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's go there. We're going to start down just a little bit in verse 2. Chapter 2, verse 2. Again, I'm reading from the Amplified, which you can follow along. You were following the ways of this world, influenced by this present age. Well, if you turn on the TV for five minutes on a news, well, it doesn't even have to be a news channel anymore. It can be a sports channel. It can be everywhere. And the, the garbage and the, and the pollution and stuff that's out there is just horrendous. I know the word says things are going to wax worse and worse. Well, I never dreamed, even in my youngest days. I thought the 60s were pretty wild. I mean, nothing compared to what we see today. But what the adversary is doing is he is unleashing. And he's trying to drive certain agendas and points home so that we get all sucked up in it. And you know what? The target really is the word because, this, and I don't want to get into the whole political thing, but we talked about the dual gender thing that's out there. It says God created what? Man and woman, basically. Four men created, right? A man and woman. So if God said it, that's good enough. But Put that out there on your Facebook page and see how you get the times. <laughs> verse 3. So, I, I, uh, let me start with verse 2. Yes. You were following the ways of this world influenced by this present age in accordance with the prince of the power of the air, Satan, the spirit who is now working, disobedient, the unbelieving who fight against the purposes of God. Among these unbelievers, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, or behavior governed by the sinful self, indulging the desires of human nature, 
Without the Holy Spirit and, and the impulses of the sinful mind, we were by nature children under the sentence of God's wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But then it says in Ephesians chapter 4, the first two words are what? But God. God butted in. Right? And this but is not just this little but. This is what I call the big birth but. I mean, it's big. So you're reading Ephesians 2 and 3. This is happening. This is happening. You're going, oh my God, what the heck is going on? How am I ever going to have this? And then it goes, but God. That'd be enough. That'd be enough. We wouldn't have to read anymore. If it says, but God, it's over for everything that was before that. Everything changed when God brought it in. Now we have to decide. Do we want to follow on the change that God made available? But he's given us the ability now. We didn't have the ability in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. We didn't have the ability to make the change on our own. If we did, we would have done it. Some of us would. I might not have. We, some of us might have done it. But we didn't have the ability. Now we have the ability. Then believer can't renew his mind because it takes more than just positive things. That's a good thing. I'm not against it. But the renewed mind takes more than that. We have the ability. We now have the ability to follow a different course, one that's governed by our love for God and energized by the Spirit of God. And we do it by renewing our minds. How do we transform ourselves? We read this word transformed in, in Romans uh, 12 2. And I know many of you know already that's the Greek word metamorpho. We get the Greek, the English word metamorphosis from it. And in the dictionary, one of the definitions says a change of the form or nature of the thing or person into a completely different one. So you think of the, the caterpillar crawling on the ground, right? It makes the little cocoon. When it though comes out, does it look anything like a caterpillar? A caterpillar can't fly. A caterpillar can look up and say, gee, I'd like to do that. It can't do that until it transforms itself. We might have looked out at other believers or other people and said, I want to be like that. Well, you can if you've got the Spirit of God and you're going to renew your mind. But the natural man can't do that. We've got the ability. We have to renew our mind. And you know what? That's the only way it comes about. So I know our theme is, again, faith, love, thanks, and prayer. But what I'm trying to get to is how do you get to the point where that's your lifestyle? The renewed mind gives wings to our spiritual lives and allows us to truly be the person that God wants us to be. And it takes a lot of energy. If you read the science about the transformation, they have to go through a lot of energy to get there. So we have to be where we have to bring every thought captive, and that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. It says, passing down imaginations of every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. One translation says, demolish your human logic. We have to do it with every thought. I am far from that. But every time we have a thought, every time something comes in, we do this not just with the things of the world, but you know where we get tricked a lot of times? We do it when it sounds religious, when it sounds Christian, and we don't take it back to validate it against the world. And so we start to buy in on it, or we don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. And so I'm not saying we just go around and like somebody swung around this book to. Uh, Jesus Christ is not God. He came up to people, well, did you read this? Did you read that? Do you believe this? And he turned off people. That's not love. That's not what I'm talking about. But we have to, to be to the point where we take it in our mind and we think about it. We just don't listen to it pass it on. And at times, many believers I've seen over the years have just followed the leader that they're in. If the leader zigs this way, they zig over with them. If they zag over here, this is way they go to. They follow the leader. And if the leader is off, well, they like that leader. The leader's great, free to be well, known for 100 years. 
that's where I want to go. If we want to develop the lifestyle of a believer, we have to start bringing every action, every thought, every action back to the Lord. Every action that we take sooner or later potentially has, has a, a benefit or a consequence. So you don't develop bad habits the first day you do something, right? You develop a bad habit after you do it over a period of time. How do you develop good habits? You develop good habits by changing to the good habits, and you do them every time. Whether you're in the story or you're in front of the crowd, you're the same person. A couple more verses here. If we go to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to what? To see. We can't be children anymore. We have to grow up. We have to be able to stand on our own two spiritual feet. We have to know what the word says. We have to love one another that if, if I see something that's maybe you need some help with, I can encourage you. I can help you. And the same with me. I need help. And yes, I've been in the word a long time, but I still need help. There's areas in my life I have not renewed my mind to. I have not changed. I have not developed the lifestyle of believing. You know, when we see things, it's easy to separate the good from the bad. That's pretty, pretty straightforward, right? But when it's really subtle and it comes to skies as truth, then it's difficult. If I pulled out a dollar bill and held it up and asked you to hold it and look at it, if it was a counterfeit, it would look like the same, a real dollar bill, it would feel like a real dollar bill. If you smelled it, it would smell like a real dollar bill, but you know what? It has no value. And when we believe and follow the counterfeit, in the end, it has no value to our lives. The adversary is very sly and subtle and deceiving. Remember, he deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden, and it stated that he was the serpent was now more subtle than any beast in the field. So the serpent is the adversary. To develop the lifestyle, we must recognize the counterfeit. And we have to realize that we're not going to be seduced by the things of the world. And always at stake is the integrity of the word. It's always at stake. But how is it at stake? It's not that the word's integrity itself. I can't demolish the integrity of the word. Where's it at stake at? It's at stake right here. It's at stake right here. I didn't understand that for years. I always thought that we had to protect the word. We got to protect the teachings of the word. God didn't need you to protect the word. He can take care of his word himself. Where do we, where, where's the integrity of the word at stake? I, I'm telling Mike, you talked about it for a few years. I, I'm just now starting to understand the integrity of the word that is at stake is not here in the written word. It's here and here. When we get this lined up with this, now we have the integrity. We start to build a lifestyle of the word. Titus 1 9 says, Holy found fast and faithful word as he has been taught. <coughs> I was going to read through Ephesians chapter 4, but I'm taking too much time on some other things. But if you read through those verses from 22, let me see where I am at that, through 32, it talks about the practical side of what we read in the first part of Ephesians. God's word isn't just telling us what to believe. It tells us what to do with that type of belief. When I read through Ephesians chapter 4 and those verses, I get reproved many times. After we were asked to leave a ministry that we've been part of for many, many years, it was a very swift and hurtful action that took place, and I was hurt really, really bad. And I had a lot of bitterness and, and anger and wrath and all everything else you can think of towards some people. And I managed to get through most of it except for a couple of people in my mind. When I think of them, I just could feel a burning on the inside, which is, oh, just made me so upset. And when I was sitting in a fellowship one day, they were reading these verses. 
And I realized that I was sinning. I just put my life down and asked God to forgive me. And that, that bitterness and wrath just went away because I realized I was wrong. This lifestyle of a believer is so wonderful because we don't get there when we start out. We work on it for a lifetime. The greatest example of transformation in the Christian church that I can think of is the Apostle Paul. He stood holding the coats of uh, those who stoned Stephen and sent it unto his death, intentionally hunted down Christians and had them thrown to prison, men and women. He was so zealous that he went to the chief priest to get letters so he could go and chase them down because he thought he was doing God's will. He was thought he was holding up the integrity for what he needed to do for the religious beliefs that he had. And he was fully into it. But when he became born again, his life changed. And we read it in Acts, and it sounds like got born again on Damascus, now he's out teaching the word all over the age, right? No, if you read Galatians, it took years. He went through, he had to learn, he had to develop, he had to change, he had to go from somebody that hated Christians to somebody who became one in London. Eventually, he spread the word all over Asia. Preaching to Gentiles, which is a group that he looked down on. It didn't take place overnight. It happened over all those years. How did he change? He renewed his mind to the truth, and he lived it until the end of his life. And I'll just close in this verse. For a couple of verses. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the pain. Man, everything he went through, the beatings, the stoning, everything that he went through, he held to the integrity of the work. He had built a lifestyle that nothing was going to move him off of. And you know what it says? Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. When we live that lifestyle, there's one waiting for us too. So what I want to encourage you is every one of us has the ability to develop that lifestyle of believe. And when, as you get there, life just becomes wonderful. That's for the first time you feel good about yourself. I didn't feel good about myself as a teenager, but I feel really good about myself now. Because, not because I'm perfect, because I'm not the, the young man that I used to be, but I'm trying to endeavor to be a wonderful believer. It's been a privilege to work with each one of you and be here with you this weekend. Thank you very much. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for all you've done for us and given us. Thank you, Father, that you've given us the ability to renew our minds. I thank you, Father, that each day, moment by moment, thought by thought, action by action, we develop that with in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.